Well, it's nearly October, so naturally my spoopy gear has shifted into maximum overdrive. It's the time of year where I most lean into comforting nostalgia, particularly media that has a spooky but not overly disturbing vibe. Kind of like palate cleansers for the twisted and gory movies that reemerge every autumn season. I do enjoy regular horror and thrillers, but tend to sway towards more lighthearted material. There's been plenty throughout the decades, and hopefully more to come. So to kick off a series of spooky-themed video essays this coming month, I thought I'd share what I typically watch to get into the Halloween spirit. First off, I want to mention the musical cartoons The Skeleton Dance and Betty Boop and Snow White. The former is the first of Walt Disney's Silly Symphony series, a popular collection of short animated films accompanied by whimsical music. I recommend watching a handful of others too, like Hell's Bells, Babes in the Woods, or Autumn. Silly Symphonies competed with Max Fleischer's Betty Boop cartoons, my favorite of which was Snow White, where they rotoscoped the dance movements of Cab Calloway, a popular jazz singer and performer. Rotoscoping involves tracing live action footage frame by frame, so the realistic movements paired with Calloway's impressive vocals resulted in more fluid and captivating animation with a slightly peculiar quality. Maybe. The imagery in these animations is actually a genre in and of itself called dance macabre, or dance of death, a popular artistic type of memento mori. This art depicting skeletons dancing merrily in a circle not only served as a reminder of the inevitability of death, but also expressed our need to find amusement amidst the dread, a last dance for comfort's sake. You can find these animated shorts here on YouTube, I'll link them below. And since they're pretty short, feel free to go down the related YouTube rabbit hole like I did. I also want to briefly mention horror movies from the 30s through the 50s. While I'll be honest and say I don't love watching old black and white films, I often make an exception for horror. Portrayals of these classic movie monsters have endured for a reason. I find them especially fascinating because you can observe how depictions of societal fears have evolved throughout the decades. It also gives us a chance to examine the roots of modern horror. And since these movies are pretty old, they're usually more cheesy than they are scary. Here are a handful I recommend. Moving on to the 60s and 70s, It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown is an especially tame option, as I find peanut specials to be rather soothing and untroubling. Perhaps something I put on in the background on a chilly fall morning while I put up decorations. And that's Bob for apples. This is the way to do it. Yeah, Lucy, you should be good at this. You have the perfect mouth for it. The 1966 special has been a Halloween staple for decades now, and like I said, I just really like its chill vibe, reinforced by the combo of jazz music and classic 2D animation. Plus, it reminds me how fun trick-or-treating was when I was a kid. I also love watching this bizarre Dr. Seuss special, Halloween is Grinch Night. It's a wonderful night for eyebrows. <laughs> This 1977 TV special was meant to be a prequel for How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Even though I watched it on VHS occasionally, for years afterward I questioned whether it actually existed. I only remembered it as some weird fever dream because the Grinch is associated with Christmas, not Halloween. You know, sir, I like you much better with my glasses off. You put your glasses back on and face the facts. It has the usual eccentricities of Dr. Seuss's work. Silly made-up words, who's in Whoville, funky animals. But it's a unique approach to Dr. Seuss's overall style. The visuals are grim and garish, with dark hues to match the autumn season. The score is chaotic and loud, with pounding drums and loose trumpets. There's also this one part where a crying baby is obviously voiced by a grown man. That doesn't really matter, I just think it's funny. Anyway, although the plot is rather incoherent, for me the special represents what Dr. Seuss books would have been like if they were spooky instead of whimsical. It's reportedly his favorite animated special, kind of like how the Lorax is his favorite book despite its bleakness. Will, will you please scare me some more, sir? I, I, I sort of like it. The story isn't particularly profound, but it can be fun to watch to get an idea of the darker version of Seuss's imagination. I'm not sure what was going on in the 80s, but they went off with practical effects. The Dark Crystal, E.T., The NeverEnding Story, Gremlins, Return to Oz, Labyrinth. Okay, I know these aren't all Halloween adjacent, 
But the tone of these films, along with the freaky practical effects, have a way of unsettling us in a way CGI can't, but not in an overly scary type of way. At least, not anymore. Sneak away. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, no, no. I like children. Those of us who watched these movies as kids found these effects rather upsetting and creepy, but now they're weirdly entertaining to revisit, and I think October is one of the best times to do it. Return to Oz in particular was nightmare fuel. <laughs> Come here, chicken! <laughs> Suffice to say, people were not expecting this type of sequel after having enjoyed The Wizard of Oz. I feel part of what makes Return to Oz different from the first is that it's closer in tone to the books these films are based on. The books written by L. Frank Baum are pretty sinister and casually violent to say the least, and Return to Oz manages to capture that ominous tone. Several other films in this decade mask their often disturbing horror-like qualities behind the guise of the fantasy genre. There seems to be a pattern of storybook-like narratives involving children going on lengthy quests and engaging in a battle of wits to emerge triumphant. In that vein, I'll throw in The Goonies as an honorable mention, as it perfectly merges this sense of adventure with eerie elements of danger and mystery. Meanwhile, Jim Henson's style is immediately recognizable in Labyrinth and The Dark Crystal, despite the stark difference between this and what we're used to seeing from him. <laughs> Henson crafted masterful puppet designs and enchanting settings with no shortage of trap doors. Piece of cake! Somehow these gross puppets are more off-putting than most adult horror monsters. Not to mention David Bowie's enthralling performance as the Goblin King. I wonder what it must have been like to be this baby. Anyway, E.T. and the NeverEnding Story also scared me as a kid, but they're ultimately really sentimental stories. The scenes are memorable in a good way, mostly. I feel like so much of them are imprinted in my memories for all time. And the endings leave you with a comforting sense of hope and childlike wonder. I think all of these films really helped pave the way for young people to enjoy the horror genre. But if these kinds of practical effects aren't your thing, maybe you can revisit Disney's short 80s foray into horror-related films for kids, like The Watcher in the Woods, The Black Cauldron, or Something Wicked This Way Comes. Before kid-friendly horror started morphing into something different altogether during the 90s, The Witches was released in 1990, an adaptation of Roald Dahl's book produced by Jim Henson Productions. So again, we got a taste of Henson's handiwork, this time in a terrifying tale about witches, a character type which became wildly popular in the 90s and seems to have made a resurgence in the last couple years. So of course I have to mention Hocus Pocus, the Disney cult classic featuring three of the most famous witches of all time. Bless you. It initially went unappreciated, but has since garnered the title of cult classic, making it a Halloween staple every October. I put a spell on you. And now you're mine. I watch it for Bette Midler's humor, the music, the touching conclusion, and just the overall aesthetic. Also the very distinct 90s aura it radiates. Oh, dude. Tubular. It's one of those films, along with Halloween Town and The Addams Family, which just feels quintessentially Halloween-like. Halloween Town in particular, which also features witches as the main characters, manages to capture the feeling of being a kid during Halloween so vividly. There's a light-hearted quality to this film that feels quite unlike anything else on this list. Though I'll admit a lot of the effects haven't aged well. Over here. Before this channel switched formats, I did a short video on why I think The Nightmare Before Christmas has stood the test of time, so naturally I'll include it here. It's still one of my favorite films ever, regardless of genre. I know there's a raging debate about whether it's a Halloween or Christmas movie, but I feel it's fine for both holidays, not entirely belonging to one or the other. For the record though, the director Henry Selick considers it a Halloween movie, because at its core, it's inspired by Halloween and focused on Halloween Town's characters. And I'll scare you right out of your pants. Selick also went on to direct James and the Giant Peach, another of my stop-motion favorites which is creepy in its own right and another good watch to consider. 
Since I've brought up Henry Selleck and Tim Burton's stop motion work, I'll continue this thread into the 2000s. Selleck also went on to direct Coraline, a film which still resides in the nightmares of those who watched it when they were children. Besides the slightly unnerving quality that gives stop motion its unique flair, I adore the eerie settings, caricature-like character designs, and supernatural elements in this film. It's based on a 2002 book of the same name, and the author Neil Gaiman is somewhat of a proponent of children's horror, sharing the sentiment that children should not only know that scary things are out there, but that they can be overcome. It's kind of an amusing irony that I never read the book as a child because the cover creeped me out. A few years prior to Coraline, Tim Burton directed The Corpse Bride, another dark and arduous labor of love. A tragic tale of romance, passion, and a murder most foul. This is gonna be good. I'll be honest and say The Corpse Bride isn't a favorite for me, as it lacks a lot of the color and charm that made A Nightmare Before Christmas so appealing. There's also Frankenweenie, where I run into a similar problem. But regardless, these films are marvelously made, though I may be biased because I think most stop motion films don't get the recognition they deserve. Oh yeah, come on boys, pick it up. And because I never have enough to say about stop motion, I'll also mention the Wallace and Gromit shorts, along with Curse of the Were-Rabbit. These short claymation films bring an air of humor to their eccentric stories and somewhat off-putting design. If this robot dog didn't terrify you as a kid, you were braver than most. To switch gears a bit, the first three Harry Potter films in particular have a nostalgic spooky vibe. I know ABC Family loves to put them on around Christmas time, but I still think the core of the series' premise and themes are more Halloween adjacent. Watching Hermione brew potions in a cauldron with strange ingredients, or Harry flying on his broomstick, or Lupin transforming into a menacing werewolf. I'm just saying, these are Halloween films at heart. When Stranger Things was first released in 2016, it felt so familiar to so many people, which is probably one of the main reasons it was so successful. Honestly, I only rewatched the first season, as I feel it's the best one and in my opinion fully works as a standalone piece. I like it for the 80s setting, the relatable kids, Winona Ryder, not to mention the numerous references to 80s films the Duffer Brothers grew up with. Our first introduction to the kids is during a Dungeons and Dragons session, just like in E.T. The Demogorgon! We're deep shit! I think a lot of people, myself included, often long for the mundane comfort of simpler times. And Stranger Things offers a captivating story set in those times, along with a compelling horror and fantasy-based plot. Lastly, Over the Garden Wall is simply one of the best shows I've watched in a long time. It's a 10-episode miniseries from Cartoon Network, created by Patrick McHale. Something feels off about this place. And again, although it's relatively new, it still manages to evoke a sense of timelessness. A portrait of the nostalgia associated with Halloween, the autumn season, and just the overall experience of growing up. It follows the story of two brothers lost in the woods, encountering various unusual characters as they try to find their way home. The music is beautiful, and the show's full of symbolism and heavy themes, giving plenty of substance for contemplation. We, we, we don't know anything about that. We're just two lost kids trying to get home. Well, welcome to the unknown, boys. You're more lost than you realize. I can't quite place what exactly makes this series feel so special. I just know it's reminiscent of books and movies that used to comfort me when I was younger. Throughout, it feels as though you're reading through a book of fairy tales, experiencing the unknown alongside realistic young characters, via a collection of warm vignettes and of creepy myths and fables. And it's a remarkable representation of the transitory nature of the fall season. Oh well, you'll join us someday. It's rather comforting to watch, especially around this time of year. Well, that wraps up my fall favorites to watch in October. I hope you enjoy watching any combination of these. Leave me a comment if you think I missed anything, and have a happy Halloween! Yeah.